Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Point Church. We're so glad you've chosen to come and worship with us this morning online. Again, this is what we're going to be doing for the foreseeable future, so we're glad that you've chosen to come in your living room or on your laptop or on your phone, however you're watching this, uh, to just worship with us together today. Now, before we get started, I want to, I want to remind you of something today, and I just want to share this with you. Today uh, is a special birthday. Today, March 29th, is Pastor Zach's birthday, and what I want to do today to start it off is I want you to sing with me, happy birthday for Pastor Zach. All right, you ready? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Zachary, happy birthday to you. All right, now listen, here's what I want you to do. It's Zach's birthday, you're not going to see him today, so what I want you to do is record your family, whoever you're worshiping with this morning, a video and post it to Zach's Facebook page, or send him a message through email, Zach at gpc.me. He needs to be flooded with your birthday love today, because you're not going to see him, because we're all at this stay-at-home uh, stuff for, for this whole virus thing. So, worship this morning with us, we're glad you're here. Let's celebrate Zach today together, and let's get into worship as we come to gather uh, and glorify God in this place. And so I want to read this, this, I want to read this prayer as we dive right back into everything today, and that is David's prayer, our guy David that we're talking about. David's prayer in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 28, it says this, so bow your heads, close your eyes with me, and listen to this prayer as we jump into worship. David writes this says, praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give thanks and praise your glorious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place though I walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing There's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Oh, when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the Blessed be your name. 
your name Jesus we just thank you father we bless your name Jesus in this place thank you father
there would not remain. Our God is round the grave. Our God is round the grave. Thank you, Lord, as we go into this time of worship and just worshiping you, Lord. This next song, which is just blatantly called The Blessing. And we bless you in this place, Lord. We glorify your name today, Jesus. i 
children, their children, their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family and your children, their children, their children. May his favor be upon you. Rejoice, Amen. Let him hear today to the Amen. 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 We rejoice, you Lord. Amen. Jesus, we bless your name with amen, Lord. We bless your name with amen. We sing it today, Lord, with full authority from you, Jesus. We sing amen. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. In this day and age, in this world today, Lord, we just praise your name. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Father. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name.
morning once again, and I promise I'm done singing for today. Uh, we do want to celebrate Pastor Zach. I hope that you'll participate in that with us this morning. We are in a series called It Is Written, and we are diving right into God's Word and walking through his whole story of Scripture and how that impacts us and what that means for us and how our lives play into the story as well. And so it is written in Psalm chapter 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest of valleys, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of all of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup just overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This was one of those bowling passages for me, and you're probably like, what the heck does that mean? Well, when I was growing up in church, this is what our youth group did. We would have bowling nights together, and if you could memorize certain scriptures, then you would get certain things at the bowling alley. So one stanza would be one free game of bowling, and the second one would get you the free shoes. Then the third one would get you a second free game of bowling, and then the fourth one, you'd get like five bucks at the snack shop, right? And so I was like... I'm in. You said bowling, America's sport, right? So I'm there. Cute little trick that we used to do in churches. But this is one of maybe the most well-known passages throughout Scripture. Probably most of us have recited this one many times uh, in our lives. And even if you're not a churchgoer, you've probably heard that passage before. Maybe if you're not involved in God's Word, it comes up in different events or different things that you have been a part of. This was written by our guy David, remember? The guy that we've been talking about here from last week and then this week as well. And David kind of brought this comfort passage to all of us. All of us have sat in the midst of this scripture in some of the most difficult times that we could ever imagine. Henry Beecher calls this a moment's opening of his soul, which I thought was a beautiful statement. And then John Trapp kind of reminds us of when this was written. It was written towards the end of King David's life, when he's kind of been experiencing all sorts of different things. He's seen everything that this life has to throw at him, and he's kind of still got one foot here on earth, but his other foot is turned towards heaven to kind of focus on what God has for him next. And he reflects back on the early days, goes right back into the times when he was a shepherd and does that metaphor as well. And then walks through some of those difficult times in those dark valleys. And then those great times of peace and prosperity had now come over his life. And he looks forward to the day when he will enter, when he will shelter in the house of the Lord. You see, there's so much of David's life to cover, and we've only focused on just a small bit of it. Remember last week, he was defeating the giant Goliath, and even though that was far from an underdog story, we saw the beauty of God working through his people. And today, we take a little bit of a turn into yet another infamous story of King David. It labeled as the greatest king in the history of the nation of Israel, until Jesus comes, of course, in the New Testament. But this man, David, was labeled a man after God's own heart. You know, how are we working on our hearts in these times when we have some time to spare? David was a man after God's own heart, but he was not without failures. He was not without faults, as we all have, right? And so how does that play out in his particular instance here in his life? And how can that help us to kind of navigate those times when we're pursuing God and pursuing God, we may slip up and have a failure from time to time. And so turn with me to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 is where we will be today. As we mentioned last week, it's at the beginning of 2 Samuel where David is anointed king over Judah and all of Israel. He's installed into that position and he almost has to reestablish the entire following of the nation back to God. It had taken an off road here and there. God's hand was with him throughout every battle as he was again a man after God's own heart. David brings back the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark was created and made, and they were following that through the desert as they go into the promised land to follow after God and his presence. He brings that Ark of the Covenant back into its rightful place. 
He desires actually to build a temple for it so God's presence would have a home. But then it's promised from God that his son would actually build that temple. And we're going to talk about Solomon next week. And so David follows that direction. He kind of shifts gears there and follows that direction because every direction that David gets, he is following within his life. And every nation and oppressor that is, that is taken, against, taken up against the nation of Israel goes down once again because King David is in place and his leadership is ruling and drawing them back to God. He even reaches out in his kingship to, to help those of his family, or those of the family of the previous king, Saul, who, remember, they were at odds. At least Saul was at odds with David. He reaches out to try to take care of them in all the blessings that they have. I mean, he was really living the life, the God-honoring life, until chapter 11. And no, he didn't go bankrupt. But Scripture says it was in this time that the kings were going off to war. There were battles to be fought, and the weather was well enough so that they could have these battles go now. And so all of the kings go off to war, except for David. For some odd reason, he does not go off into these particular battles. And in chapter 11, 2 Samuel, it says this, verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. So essentially, David was having kind of a little nap time in the afternoon, and evening came, and it was time to get up and kind of wander around. It wasn't uncommon for beds to be actually up on the roof because they got the better wind and breeze at that point. Scripture says, from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Uh Uh-oh. And the woman was very beautiful. Oh, no. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. And so you think, oh, well, she's taken. It was just kind of an unintended peak right there. And I actually have a relationship with Uriah. I know him. He's one of my guys. And I've heard of Eliam as well. So we'll just move right along, move right past that. The scripture says, then David sent messengers to get her. No, no, no. King David, don't do that, right? And she came to him because that's what you do when the king summons your presence. You go to the king. He is the authority. And he slept with her. And then she went back home. The end. Moment of weakness. Glad we're through that one, right? No one has to know. Nobody has to know. Except in verse 5, it says, the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Now what? (laughs) Now watch how this spirals out of control. Verse 6, so David sent his word to Joab, he was the commander of his armies, send me Uriah the Hittite, he said. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. He just kind of chit-chatting, making small talk. And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. That means what you think it's supposed to mean. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all of his master's servants and did not go down to his house. And see, King David finds this out. He's like, uh, dude, wh- what are you doing? <laughs> I- I'm showing you favor here. I- I'm giving you a blessing here. I'm giving you a gift. Uh, this is what you're supposed to go do. And Uriah responds with this in verse 11. He says, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander, Joab, and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Do you see the kind of loyalty that we're dealing with here? There's there's a loyalty going to his fellow warriors that are still out in battle, this Uriah. And and Uriah shows his loyalty to his commanding officer, Joab. He doesn't want to spoil anything there. And then you actually see this incredible loyalty to King David himself. He's loyal to a king that was the farthest thing from loyal to him. David even tries to get him drunk the next day and to manipulate the situation a little bit further so that things can work out the way that he has planned them to work out. But Uriah was just not going to let that happen. And so in verse 14, it says, In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab 
and sent it with Uriah. He was sending him back into the battlefields. It says, in it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. He literally had him carry his own death note with him back to the battlefield. I think that's kind of dirty myself. He's going to a whole other levels now. In verse 16 it says, So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. You see, on that battleground, on that battlefield, they actually won that battle. And when men were coming back to share what had happened with King David, they came back and they said, well, it was, it was brutal and we lost a bunch of guys and, and it was just really rough. But Uriah the Hittite died. And when David's response to that was pretty much, okay, well, um, you win some, you lose some. Thanks for your effort, guys. In verse 26, it says, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. And just listen to this last phrase in this, this part. It says, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Well, duh, right? Of course it displeased the Lord. Listen, if you're seeking to follow after God, and if you're, you're very familiar with God's words, you spend time in the scriptures, then it's pretty easy to understand that this was a very blatant sin. But if you are one of those that are they're far from God and just trying to check out what this Christianity thing is all about, then you might be thinking, what was the harm in all of this? It's actually what I'm hoping for every Friday and Saturday night when I can go to the bars and hang out. I, I wouldn't want to kill anybody and kind of the baby throws a wrinkle into some stuff. But listen, he's just living his life. He's just being a man. What I want you to know is that this visual here is for all of us to be careful with. You see, watch what sin does in the midst of all of this. The scripture says that sin so easily entangles us within this world, and this story from David's life is certainly no exception of that. Even from a godly man, a God-fearing man, who we have very little negativity before this event, and then after this event, very little negativity towards King David, but this one hallmark event explodes into David's life through this episode. And look at how this all works. It was either one moment of weakness or a happenstance moment. A very innocent and maybe unexpected glance that turned into more of a gaze and then morphed into lust. And because he could, he had the authority, then it moved into this sexually immoral act that happens. And then the lying starts happening, and the deception comes, and there's, there's an abuse of alcohol, there's an abuse of power here, then there's more deception, and ultimately, the responsibility of actually taking someone's life. And don't forget the cover-up at the very end, the, the fact that once this was all done, and he quickly brought her into the castle and married her as fast as could be to make sure everybody knew that this was their child and it wasn't an issue, it just kind of gets really gross and distorted very, very quickly. But let's just not throw David under the bus here, right? Because hey, we can look at him and go, wow, that's one messed up dude. Look, he really screwed that one up. But this is exactly how sin works in all of our lives. The hopes that it doesn't lead to the, the circumstances or the consequences that happens within David's is, is an evident thing for us. But what starts off is maybe a little white lie for us. Maybe it's just a pad of paper or a pen that we gank from the office, or maybe it's just a little bit of a flub on our taxes as we're trying to work those out, or maybe, maybe we skew a financial picture here and there to make things look a little bit better. Maybe a, there's a friendship at work that all of a sudden somehow becomes a relationship at work, or maybe it's even a quick glance at something that pops up on your computer. Guys, we better be very careful about those quick little glances because we have seen in the life of David that on and on and on it goes. And there only has to be a little bit of a window 
a little something that gets into our lives and it just entangles us. It has all the opportunity of snowballing into something where when you look at the mirror in the morning, you have no idea who you are recognizing because it's nobody that you would ever want to be. It's not a lifestyle that you would have chosen when you were young. It's not anything that you wanted for anybody that you love, but somehow you are in those circumstances now because sin has taken over your lives. Listen, don't kid yourself. None of us are immune to sin. It's almost like a virus. And I know every pastor on the planet is talking about a virus and trying to weave this into their messages, but the reality of it is this. Sin is like a virus, and it can't... It, it can work its way through our lives. Without us even really knowing what it is, it, we don't even recognize that we have it, and all of a sudden the symptoms start to rear their ugly heads, and, and you not only infect your life and what's going on with you, but now it starts to impact everybody else around you and everybody that you've come in contact with and the people that you care so deeply about. This little sin has impacted your life, and if we're not careful, if we're not diligent in what we're doing, it could be devastating for us. And with the virus, it actually has been so devastating for so many people and that's what sin does it's how sin works in our lives it's how the evil one takes a foothold within our lives make no mistake see David understood that his only response to this sin the only response to sin in his life his only course of action now his only hope was that he would shelter in the house of the Lord he had to go back Somehow he had to get back into the house of the Lord. And so how do we deal with sin in our life? How do we deal with these things that keep coming over again and again within us? How is it that these things get entangled in our lives and then they lead us far away from God? How do we deal with that and try to get back into the shelter of the Most High God? Look at what David did and how we can participate in this as well. The first thing is this, is that you have to have and accept accountability. You have to have and accept accountability. Chapter 12 is this, this conversation between Nathan and David. Nathan was a prophet within David's kingdom. And they had an in-depth relationship before all of this. We, we have to recognize that Nathan was speaking the truth into King David's life for a while now. He was an advisor for him. Scripture says that when David had that visual, that, that vision of building the temple uh, for God's presence to be involved with, it was Nathan that came along and spoke the words of God into his life saying, no, 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 God doesn't want that for you. He wants that for your son. He's promising that for your son. And so David shifts. He listens wholeheartedly to his accountability partner, if you will, which that happens back in chapter 7. And then we have this episode in chapter 12 where Nathan comes before King David and he shares this, this fictitious story. I'm sure he didn't really know how to approach his friend with this, especially his king friend with something like this. And so he shares this fictitious story, and you can read through there. It's about a rich man and a poor man, and it's a story of, of power and authority and selfishness that's just abused upon this poor man. And when David is done hearing this story, he's absolutely fuming. He is furious, and he, his response is, I don't care who this man is, who this rich punk is, he deserves to die, and he should pay back four times what he's taken from the poor man. And Nathan simply steps up. In a moment of courage, in a moment of accountability, and he says, you are the man. And it wasn't one of those things where it was like, you're the man, David, woo! No, it was like, this guy is you. You're the one that did this. This was revealed to me through God, and I know the story, I know Bathsheba, I know what you've done to Uriah. It is you, David, the Lord has seen your sin. And David is just completely cut to the heart by his friend that shares this. Verse 13 of chapter 12, it says, I have sinned against the Lord. David recognized it immediately. And he took it from his friend. So a couple of quick hitters under, under accountability for us. One is, you have to have a relationship I love it when people just try to share all their opinions and tell people how it is and this is what you should be doing when you have no relationship with them. It just doesn't ever work. Nathan and David had built this thing up for years, and this was a huge conversation, no doubt, and it was a huge step for them, but it wasn't the first time 
that David had had this with Nathan, and it wasn't the last time either. Nathan actually comes along after the birth of a, another son between David and Bathsheba, and he actually speaks God's blessing over that child as well. And then later on in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, he tells of, of an eventual, uh, uh, it tells of an eventual child between David and Bathsheba, and they actually name him Nathan after their buddy. You see, if you're going to have these tough conversations, then you have to have a tough enough relationship to get through it. If you're going to have a tough conversation, then you better have a tough enough relationship to get through it. And many times we're actually shown the level of our relationships through the efforts of accountability and how tough things could get in that. And so one, you have to have a relationship to be accountable and be held accountable. But the second one is this, is you have to have someone that is willing to give it and someone that is willing to take it and accept it in their lives. You see, you have friends for a reason. You have close friends. You choose your friends to help navigate through this life. And it kind of, it goes both ways. You're both helping one another to do that. That's also why it's so important as to whom you choose to be within your inner circle, to have those deep, dark conversations with you. You see, because your circle should be able to call you out on stuff. You should know who your circle is, and they should be able to call you out on stuff. And if they can't, or if you dismiss it and you push it aside, then they're not really in your circle. Because you have to be willing to give it. You have to be willing to accept it, just as David and Nathan shared together here. So the first part in how we battle against sin, how we battle with dealing with our sin, is this. You have to have and accept accountability. The second part is this, is that you have to confess it and repent of it. You have to confess it and repent of those sins. That's how we are dealing with the sins that we are entangled with. You see, David comes along and he he recognizes it. Remember, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. But then he goes farther with this. And and he shares a picture of his repentance in, in a scripture in Psalm 51, another very popular psalm. But it's attributed to King David right after the mess that he was in. Right after this moment in his life where sin was so prevalent and it just snowballed, this is what David says in his repentant heart is in confessing to God in Psalm 51. Just a few excerpts from that. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He just keeps dwelling on it. He keeps coming back to him. There's a guilt there. There's a shame there. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge me and my actions. Verse 7 It says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed now rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God. You see, the man after God's own heart asks to create that again within his life. He says, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, O God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. In verse 17, he says, my sacrifice, O God. He's not talking about the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, how the Israelites had to bring different lambs and different doves and different animals to sacrifice for the sins that they'd brought. For the sins that they had brought to God, he says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise that. You see, David wrestles through this this horrible decision that he had made, the sin against God, and he repents of that and confesses it and seeks out God's forgiveness. He says, clean me, wash me, God, restore me, bring your spirit back to me. Take away all of my iniquities that I might be right with you. Sustain my heart that is now broken before you, God. You see, he's constantly repenting and confessing of this sin in his life. And that's what you and I need to do as well. Whatever it is that you've struggled with, that one decision that just has has damaged some things, some damaging relationship that you have had with God, he says, confess it and repent from that. Because not only do you lay it before God, but then you get away from it as best that you can. You run 180 degrees in the opposite direction. You walk away from the battlefield. 
you leave that as one victorious in the hands of God. And so you have and accept accountability as you deal with sin. You confess that sin and you repent of that sin is what David did. And then the third thing is this, is that you have to deal with the consequences of our actions in a godly way. See, David had severe consequences for this. And and it was brought on by God. And scripture kind of reveals what those things are for us. Chapter 12, verse 10, it says, the sword will never depart from your house. This is Nathan speaking to King David in this moment. The sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Verse 11, another one. Out of your household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Verse 13, it says, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die, but because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Huge consequences for actions apart from the will of God. And each one of these plays out Throughout the rest of David's life, the kingdom was always under attack. They were always in battle from this moment on. And that was both from foreign and domestic because his family was kind of in shambles and his sons were trying to rise up and take over power. And some did at one point, but it was this constant back and forth. And even the son that was conceived in the sin with Bathsheba, a week after the conversation of Nathan and David, he is ill and dies. And so while David pleads to God throughout the rest of his life, begs God to take some of these consequences away, each and every time he wants to honor God, he chooses to honor God and glorify God through all the great things, but also through all the terrible things as well. Listen, I don't know what you have done and you don't know what I've done. Actions that you have chosen to do, whether or not they line up with what God has for you in your life or what God has chosen not for you to do, but you've done that anyway. But listen, the consequences will always be there. They will always be there. Sometimes they're going to be huge and sometimes they're going to be small. Sometimes it'll be immediate reactions and sometimes it'll be way off in the distance, but the consequences will continue to come. Some will be incredible consequences and some will be horrific things that you could never imagine like King David here. But it's in the accountability that we hold with God. You see, that's the reaction that we must have when our sins bring consequences. We have to react with accountability to God. We have to look at how David looked, that his mercies and his uh, judgments are right and fair. It's in the accountability that we hold with God and how we respond to them within our lives that reveals whether our hearts are beginning to change for him. And so we have to have and accept accountability, and then we have to confess of these sins and repent of those sins, and then as we're dealing with the consequences of those sins, we have to do that in a God-honoring way that's seeking His glory and His honor, even in those difficult times. And then finally, we have to live a changed life. If we want to battle against these sins, we have to get rid of them out of our lives and live as changed people. David's life changed that day. And now we don't know if he ever sinned again, but I'm assuming that he probably did. And we don't know whether he sinned in this same manner at all. But what we do know is that he was pursuing God over and over and over again. His life changed for God. Throughout all of the battles, through the struggles within his family, through the praises and applause of, and the accolades that he got from being the greatest king in the nation of Israel up until Jesus was that God got the glory first and foremost. It wasn't about him. You see, he lived a changed life. And there's a story in the New Testament that you may be familiar with if you've been involved in God's word. It's in John chapter 8. It's the story of the woman that's caught in adultery. If you go back and read that story, it's very unique, but there is obviously a blatant sin of adultery happening here. And she's exposed for the world to see, and the only response that really matters in that moment is Jesus' response. And what I would tell all of us today is that the only response to our sin is, that matters is Jesus' response to our sin. You see, they wanted to embarrass this young woman and, and bring her out for all to see, and they actually did that. They wanted to display her horrible life decisions and choices for everyone around to, to make fun of, and they did that. And they even wanted to stone her and kill her. 
And they had every legal right to do that as, as the sin in that day. There was legal precedence for her being stoned to death because of this sin. But Jesus steps forward. See, Jesus' response was different. Jesus said this, if you are without sin, then you take the first shot at her with your stone. And as the stones fell to the ground, because they were dropped, not because they were thrown, one by one, all these teachers and rulers and, and, and authorities in the law and scripture, all these Pharisees just walked away because of Jesus' response. And he looks down at this young woman and he says, nobody has condemned you. He says, then neither do I. He says, I do not condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. You see, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, is what John says. He says, Jesus came into the world to save the world through him. And this is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that while our sins might be blatant to the world around us, and they might only be blatant to Jesus, because he sees whether anyone else does or not, And while we may have accountability in place to help with this and help navigate this life, and while many times it seems that we're repenting from things again and again in this life, and while the consequences that we face might be something that's coming immediate or in the long-lasting effects in our lives and how we end up living, we know that the consequences of our sin are no longer punishments for us. I want you to hear this. They're no longer punishments for us because the punishment that brings us peace was now upon Jesus and his response to our sins. The punishment that brings us peace was on Jesus at the cross. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, that loving act of atonement that took our place, that took our sins, that took our moments when we have tried to live so much like God and have fallen subject to sin and it's entangled our lives, he has taken those sins for us on the cross. And that act of atonement is what gives us the opportunity to look into the eyes of Jesus and him say, go and leave your life of sin now. Just as David did. And being known as God's, a man after God's own heart. You see, we deal with sin through accountability. We deal with sin through confession. And we deal with sin through repentance. And we deal with sin by living our lives of consequences under the grace of a consequential king. That's the beauty of King Jesus. Who comes down a long line from King David. And so in this time of uncertainty, in this time where we have a lot of time on our hands, in this time when we feel ourselves drifting away from God and maybe beginning some of those moments that could get entangled for us, we move back to Jesus. We dive into Jesus and the grace and peace that comes through him. And so we pray that over you today. We pray that over us today. Grace and peace to you. Let's pray. Psalm 32, another psalm from David says this, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand, O God, was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And then... David writes, I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach us. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Holy Father God, we pray for your protection. We pray for your healing. God, we pray for your forgiveness that you give freely through the actions of your son Jesus. God, lead us to him. Above all else, lead us to him. 
as we try to deal with our lives here on earth. God, we love you and praise you. It's in your son's beautiful name we do pray. Amen.
Thank you once again for joining us online to worship together as a church family here at Grace Point. Just a couple of things before we head out for today. Uh, please don't turn this off because this stuff's kind of important. Uh, one thing is this, is because of our uh, stay at home uh, uh, challenge uh, through our government, we are going to have to close our offices here at the church. Um, so those will be closed out throughout the week. Um, we are going to be checking messages and going to be uh, doing emails and all of that from home. Uh, we, we, can, we can be portable if we need to. And so um, please don't hesitate to call or, or, or send an email to the church and, and we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. If you are in need of any kind of help whatsoever, we are here to help you. We've got some food that's being stored in our cafe. Um, we've got some, some gift cards if those things are needed for you. Um, we just want to help in any way way possible. And so even though the offices are closed, we're going to be checking all of that and, and we want to be a part uh, of working through all of this uh, with you all. So please don't hesitate to call or email. And if you have some food that you've purchased that you're still going to drop by, just send us a call or an email to let us know and we'll, we'll meet you up here uh, and get you in and, and, and be able to drop that off for uh, everybody. Okay. Secondly is this, you should have received an email today. If you're on our email list from Right Now Media, um, we have purchased that as a gift to all of our folks here at Grace Point, and anybody that you want to share that with, that is for anybody and everybody, but we want you to know uh, that we continue to call you to dive into God's Word in these times when we may have some extra time, uh, and this is a tool that can help you do that. It's a Christian Netflix type of thing with over 25,000 different Bible studies and, and shows and kids shows and all sorts of different curriculum on there. We'd love for you to get involved with that. We'd love for you to use that in this time. Uh, it's a great, great tool. If you did not get that, please send us a message through our Facebook page or send us an email at the church, joel at gpc.me, um, and we'll get you onto our list and get you that sent out to you um, so that you can start using that as quickly as possible. But send us a direct message through Facebook or through our email as well. And then finally, before we go, hey, listen, don't forget, you need to fill Zach's page with birthday songs, sing him ridiculously, make sure that he knows how much we love him as a church family and just celebrate him today as we gather and celebrate God together as well. We love you. Be safe out there, stay at home, uh, take care of your family and yourselves.